This is Sandy. And this is Danny. You know them from Greece. You know this outfit. And this one. And of course, this one. But are they accurate? We got this fashion historian. Hi, I'm Raisa Britannia, and I'm a fashion historian. To walk us through what the movie got right and what they got wrong about these looks. First, let's establish the setting. The movie is set in Southern California during the 1957-1958 school year. We know this because the opening beach scene takes place at Leo Carrillo State Park in Malibu. And why exactly 1958? We can see another clue in the diner scene where Richie Valens' rendition of La Bamba is playing. Okay, the meeting is at session. And that was released in 1958. Rydell High is a fictional high school meant to represent the all-American ideal, not unlike those featured on American Bandstand. Anything else you'd like to add? Grease is based on a Broadway musical which premiered in 1972, and the film was released in 1978. This film is a postmodern interpretation of the 1950s, likely made by filmmakers who were teenagers at the time. This film prioritizes nostalgia over historical accuracy, and that's because they really rely on these archetypes that were established in the 1950s. Grease is inspired by the teen films of the late 1950s, like High School Confidential, Untamed Youth, and Teenage Thunder. Grease is the quintessential teen film, and that's because it was in the 1950s that teenagers first truly became recognized as their own subset. The concept of the teenager was a post-war invention, and in 1945, the New York Times published the Teenage Bill of Rights, which was a manifesto that outlined how to live the teenage life. The year 1945 coincides with the end of World War II, and teenagers were really allowed to revel in their youth. Amazing. Let's get into the looks. First up is Sandy's Summer Nights look. In this look, Sandy embodies the 1950s good girl archetype. Others were Doris Day and Debbie Reynolds. The character's full name is Sandy Olson, but a lot of people think that her name is Sandra D based on the song. But actually, Sandra Dee was a real American actress who was very famous in the 1950s. This costume represents the ideals established by mainstream fashion, and that was of the new look silhouette introduced by Christian Dior in 1947. Okay, let's draw Sandy's look from the undergarments up. First up, the underwear. We do see a peak of accurate 1950s underwear in this sleepover scene. Her undergarments would have consisted of a brassiere and high-waist panties. The brassiere of the 1950s was commonly known as the bullet bra, notable for its pointed cups. Stockings could be worn by more mature teenagers, but were often usually just worn by adult women. Let's move on to the next layer. A half slip could be worn over the panties and underneath the petticoat, and that pretty much just looked like a skirt. The petticoat of the 1950s, sometimes called a crinoline, could get very, very full, and multiple layers could be worn to create that voluminous silhouette. Sandy is wearing at least one petticoat, and we see the hem of it peeking out right here. So this is actually accurate. Okay, up next, the shirt. Sandy wears a white collared button-down shirt, which was a schoolgirl staple rooted in the tradition of the school uniform. This also seems accurate. Sandy's casting in the good girl archetype is further reinforced by the Peter Pan collar on her shirt, and that is rounded right at the neck. This is in direct contrast to the pointed popped collar, which was more closely associated with the bad girl. Moving on to the skirt. Sandy's skirt is entirely accurate because it's cut in a very full circle and nipped at the waist, further emphasized by a wide belt. We see these wide waist cinching belts on several characters throughout the film. Perhaps more commonly associated with teenagers in the 1950s is the poodle skirt. While poodle skirts were certainly popular with teenagers during the 1950s, they really became more emblematic of the 1950s in the decades following. The poodle skirt was invented by Julie Lynn Charlotte, who wanted a festive skirt to wear to a holiday party. So she cut a circle out of felt, a smaller circle on the inside, and then made a little festive poodle to stitch on top. 
Important to note that it wasn't just poodles. All types of novelty appliques were applied to these skirts, such as other dogs, or flowers, or umbrellas, or raindrops. As they grew in popularity, poodle skirts would eventually be manufactured commercially. However, they were still more commonly regarded as a home sewing project. We do see Patty Simcox wearing a poodle skirt in this scene, and she's pretty much a caricature of the 1950s teen. Next up, the cardigan. We see Sandy wearing a cardigan draped over her shoulders, which was a very fashionable way to wear this. She does remove it later on in the song, but she could wear a sweater clip to help secure it if she wanted to keep it on. The sweater clip was a functional piece of jewelry that basically consisted of two individual clips connected by a decorative chain, and that was used to hold the sweater on your shoulders. And for that reason, it was also called a sweater guard. Another fashionable way to wear your cardigan sweater in the 1950s was actually backwards, with the buttons going up the back. And that brings us to the shoes. Here we have Sandy wearing a sensible pair of shoes with a low heel, perfect for a day at school. The style of shoe more commonly associated with the 1950s schoolgirl, however, was the two-toned saddle shoe, often worn with white bobby socks. Onto the hair. Sandy's hair isn't glaringly inaccurate, but it does seem to more closely resemble 1970s hairstyles. It's really the short bangs that add that definitive 1950s touch. These bangs were especially popular for younger women and teens. In the 1950s, women often set their hair in curls overnight, as we can see in the sleepover scene. These styles can be seen on the characters Frenchie and Marty, and this is probably a bit more accurate. The decorative clips that she wears are pretty accurate and were often used to tuck the hair behind the ears. And finally, the jewelry. We can see that Sandy doesn't wear any earrings in this scene, and that's because Frenchie hasn't pierced her ears yet. Actually, having pierced ears was far less common in the 1950s than it is today. Because of this, most earrings were actually clip-ons or screwbacks. Especially fashionable were larger styles that featured pearls and lightweight plastic. Overall, this look is pretty accurate. So here's what Sandy's Summer Nights outfit would have looked like compared to the one in the film. Because they go together, let's talk about Danny's look. The character of Danny Zuko takes inspiration from 1950s rebel heartthrobs like Marlon Brando and James Dean. Greasers were part of a 1950s youth subculture that was born out of the working class. With the rise of the teenager in the 1950s, counterculture actually became widely acknowledged in popular mainstream culture. And this is where we start to see the difference between fashion and anti-fashion. Anti-fashion actively subverts the standards set up by the fashion system. The character of Danny Zuko romanticizes counterculture and anti-fashion as we can see in this look. The individual layers that Danny wears are easy enough to replicate, but really this look is based not on the clothes themselves, but the attitude with which they're worn. <laughs> well, that's cool, baby. I mean, you know how it is, rocking and rolling and whatnot. <laughs> Danny? Let's break down Danny's look. First up, the underwear. As is the case today, there was variation in men's underwear. Boxer briefs during this time were shorter and more fitted. A sleeveless cotton singlet could also be worn as an undershirt. This is another style of undershirt, except worn as an outer garment. Let's look at the next layer. Here, Danny is wearing a white t-shirt, but later he's often shown wearing a plain black t-shirt. This was likely a choice by the costume designer to help distinguish him as the romantic male lead amongst a group of actors essentially wearing the same thing. Next up, the pants. Blue jeans would have been the norm in both the mainstream youth culture and the greaser subculture, as we can see in many scenes throughout the film. He may have been wearing Levi's 501 jeans, which were a long-standing classic. They featured a button fly and a straight leg. And in the 1950s, these jeans would have typically been worn cuffed at the ankle. Men typically wore their trousers closer to the natural waistline rather than the lower hip line. Next up, the iconic T-Bird leather jacket. The black leather motorcycle jacket is the paramount feature of the greaser look. 
This iconic style was introduced by Harley Davidson. It is recognizable by its off-center zipper closure, metal fastenings, diagonal pockets, and a belt at the bottom. Of course, what makes this jacket unique to Greece is the T-Birds logo on the back. This could be a nod to the racing club jackets worn by teenagers in the 1950s, which is the perfect foil to the pink ladies jacket. Moving down to the shoes. Danny wears black Oxfords with white socks, which is an obvious reference to the shoes worn by 1950s rock and roll sex symbol, Elvis Presley. The obvious desire to equate Danny with a teen heartthrob is a conscious choice made by the filmmakers. Elvis's cultural influence was unparalleled, and we can see Danny's style of singing and dancing closely resembles that made popular by Elvis. Danny more likely would have been wearing Converse high tops or very durable motorcycle boots, like those we see on Kaniki. These sturdy boots harken back to the greasers' working class roots. And last, but certainly not least, the hair. The greaser look would not be complete without that hairstyle. The pompadour style, also made famous by Elvis, featured slicked sides and a lot of volume at the top. Achieving this hairstyle required a lot of hair product, like pomade or wax or grease. There were variations in rockabilly hairstyles worn by musicians at the time, and we can see that in Danny's hairstyle with that signature little curl in the front. Danny's hair is super accurate, super on point. Danny's look in Greece helped to solidify the rebel without a cause archetype that was established by Marlon Brando and James Dean in the 1950s. So here's what Danny's outfit would have looked like compared to the one he wore in the film. Because we know this is the one that you want, let's move on to Sandy's finale transformation look. This is undoubtedly the most iconic look in the film, but it's actually the least accurate and most problematic. Tell me about it, stud. Let's move past the fact that she has to change herself to keep her man and focus on the bad girl archetype that dominated 1950s film. Here, she embodies the female teenage rebel, further emphasized by her entrance with a cigarette that she quickly puts out. This look is actually heavily influenced by the 1970s, and the line between 70s fashion and 50s costume is blurred when Olivia Newton-John wears a very similar look to the premiere of Grease. Some actresses that embodied this 1950s bad girl archetype were Mamie Van Doren, Joan Collins, Ava Gardner, and Elizabeth Taylor. Let's see what this look would have looked like. First up, the undergarments. The undergarments would be similar to that worn in her first look, except this time probably black instead of white. Additionally, her bra may have been strapless to accommodate the open neckline. Again, the bullet bra style featured severely pointed cups, and these things called falsies were these little triangular foam pieces that were placed inside the bra to fill in the point. This leads us to the shirt. Sandy wears a black off-the-shoulder top, and that was a style worn by the bombshells and bad girls of the 1950s. Another iconic variation of the same type was the sweater girl. The sweater girl trope was established in 1937 with Lana Turner, but she would remain a cultural fixture throughout the 1940s and 50s, especially in film. The sweater girl became synonymous with the bad girl because the body-hugging knits that she wore showed off her dangerous curves, especially over that bullet bra. Next up, those pants. While pants still weren't widely accepted as workwear for adults, they were a staple in sportswear for teenagers. At this time, sportswear was distinctly American in style, which is perfect for this film because it celebrates both Americana and youth culture. Pants at this time were usually cropped and fitted, but not nearly as tight as they are in this scene. Sandy wears shiny black spandex pants that were reportedly so tight that she had to be sewn into them on set. Pants this tight would have required spandex to achieve that level of stretch. However, spandex wasn't invented until 1959 by DuPont, an American chemical company. 
Women in the 1950s were eager to wear pants. And one of the biggest supporters of this movement was famed actress Kay Thompson, and also author of the Eloise book. She wanted to wear pants so bad that she actually started her own line called Fancy Pants. And now, of course, the jacket. This leather jacket is first and foremost a visual storytelling device used to align her with Danny's greaser style. The idea of a lady in a leather jacket was not as firmly established. However, Harley Davidson did release a style in their 1954 catalog called the Ladies Companion Jacket. This could be another nod to the racing club jackets worn by both male and female teenagers at the time. Let's look at those shoes. Sandy wears saucy red mules with a high heel and somehow impressively navigates both the grass and a moving fun house, all while doing choreography. How? There may be some movie magic keeping that shoe on her foot, but there's actually a unique feature built in to help keep it on. This was called the spring later invented by American shoe designer Beth Levine. The spring elator was a special insole that featured an elastic panel that hugged the arch of the foot and kept the shoe in place. Moving on to the hair. This is 1970s hair. This is Olivia Newton-John's hair. In the 1950s, hair was usually worn shorter, above the shoulders. We can see that Sandy's hair is pretty long here. Additionally, we see that her curls are pretty teased out, and in the 1950s, those would be a lot more contained. A popular bad girl hairstyle was short and cropped with face framing curls, not unlike the one we see on Rizzo. This was called the Italian cut and became especially popular in 1953. And finally, the jewelry. Now that Sandy has her ears pierced, she wears a pair of gold hoops. Although clip-on gold hoops did exist. These are totally accurate to the bad girl archetype. It makes sense that the best known costume in this film is one that would appeal to audiences in 1978. This look is so iconic that it's become closely tied to Olivia Newton-John's own star persona. So here is what Sandy's finale transformation outfit would have looked like compared to the one in the film. Throughout film history, supporting characters are often more accurate than the romantic leads, and this movie is no exception. Kaniki and Rizzo are actually a lot more accurately depicted than Sandy and Danny. Overall, the individual pieces of clothing are simple enough that it's kind of hard to get them wrong. Jeans, t-shirt. However, if you're looking at historical accuracy, you kind of have to look beyond that at really subtle nuance in styling. Any inaccuracies are subtle enough that they don't necessarily distract from the story, but are there to help cater to the 1970s audiences. Grease is a movie that cashes in on nostalgia and continues to perpetuate the idea of the 1950s American teen ideal, even for those who weren't teenagers in the 1950s. This film perpetuates elements of youth culture which have roots in the 1950s and continue to speak even to teenagers today. So here's a more accurate idea of what Sandy and Danny would have looked like had they lived in history.